The, th the thing that people mess up a lot of times is. We got gas ties by a street car. <laughs> All right, y'all, real quick before we start this video, I want to give a huge shout out to 10 Soldier Race Cars for uh, what they did for us in this video. Um, I know some of you know we had a pretty good weekend racing at Slugfest, but we can't upload those videos yet till we get this one up because the only reason that, we're, that Billy was able to go racing this weekend and do well was because 10 Soldier Race Cars and what they did for us. Getting the Nova lined out and uh, making it drive much better, getting the, fi the wishbone fixed placed all the heim joints and everything. They took Billy in last minute and got them all fixed up and uh, the Nova's never been better. So so huge shout out to them. If you guys could please go and uh, check out their YouTube and Facebook, 10 Soldier Race Cars. Um, they do awesome work. They have awesome parts um, and their videos are getting really good. They, uh, they hired a guy to film for him and I've talked to him before. He's very good at what he does. The quality is awesome on their channel. They're just a wealth of knowledge over there. Um, really smart guys. They have some awesome videos. Like my favorite video they've ever put up is probably the four link 101 video showing their four link setup. Um, they go through everything and it's probably one of the best explanations I've ever watched on 4Link. Jason Terrell does these Motivational Mondays, and I like watching those. Those are always great. Um, they post the racing videos, Racing Charlie Brown. Um, they got so much stuff, and it's amazing quality, awesome content. So please make sure you guys go and check out their channels. Give them a follow and uh, subscribe to their YouTube. We would greatly appreciate it. So uh, thank you, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. All right, guys, so today we are taking the car to 10 Soldiers Race Cars in Kentucky. I noticed in my last video we had a little bit of play in the rear suspension. The rear end was moving side to side a little bit. So I got to check in my, uh, my wishbone in the car. So every four link, every parallel four link has a wishbone to center in the car and keep it from going side to side. Um, anyways, I checked the wishbone. And there's definitely quite a bit of play in the one that's in the car. So I got a hold of Jason at 10 Soldiers, and he said bring the car down, and he would make a new one based off my old one. He's going to look everything over and make a new wishbone, and we'll address any other problems it has in the rear suspension while they're there. I really trust these guys. They're uh, awesome race car builders. They sponsor our, they sponsor our local event in... Uh, Edgewater called Cincy Street Nights. These guys are top-notch builders. Uh, they do amazing work. So I'm excited to go to their shop for the first time today. So yeah, we're gonna load the car up, take it over to 10 Soldiers, and uh, let them work their magic. Where the magic happens, huh? Oh, look at all them wallies. <laughs> this is where people come to win races, huh? Well, pretty decent at it. Yeah. Yeah. If my dad said if we sucked, that he would take our name back. Cause, <laughs> cause he's done a pretty good job. <laughs> That's awesome. Is this your first time here? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I so said there's only a few chassis shops I would trust to work on stuff. We made the cut. You're one, you're yeah. one of them. <laughs> barely made the cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's my head. All right, so we're here at 10 Soldier Race Cars here in, what is it, Kentucky? Yeah, What's we're it? in Kentucky, bud. We're not in Ohio anymore. Yeah, you we're, bar you barely made it, but you're in Kentucky. <laughs> we're, we're barely in Kentucky. It don't really feel like Kentucky. It's not that it's, Kentucky it's yet. It's messed it's, up, man. It's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> close, so. How long you guys been here? We've been in, we've been in business for seven years. So our seven year anniversary was last month. Um, yeah, we just always have played with race cars. We've been in this spot for 
this particular building for about five years. So, yeah. and then hopefully, Lord willing, as long as everything happens, well, hopefully we'll be moving in the next six-ish months. Yeah, so try you're, to out, you're out growing it already again. Yeah, it's, uh, we do far too much, far small, too small of a space. So as uh, you'll see on the video, our shipping, receiving, Ricky's media room, my wife's office, everything. <laughs> yeah. So, daycare. Yeah. All in one spot. So I feel it, man. Yeah. True family business. Like, like my kids color on boxes. And, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, you never know what you're going to walk into on a certain day. So, and I love that about it. Yeah. You know, I grew up in my dad's business and I wanted the same for my kids so they could see like the value of going to work every day. Oh you know? yeah. I wanted you guys to check everything over. When I first like bought the car, I wanted to take it there like right away, but it just, what well, didn't make any sense yet. It wasn't far along, far enough along, but uh, now we get to look everything over and see what all's messed up on it. What what you would change, you know. I want the car to be safe as possible. Yeah. You know, you're about to go faster than you ever been. Yeah. So to go faster than you ever been, you got to go places you've never been before. So. Right. And on the video, I saw the the rear end was moving around in the car just a little bit. I could see it was moving side to side, especially when I got out of it on the big end. Um, so we want to do everything we can to correct that and make it make it right yeah so we're gonna go over the wishbone i want to check all the hans and stuff in the floor link just because it's it's older stuff um it looked like from your video we've talked it, it's set up pretty good yeah so it looked like it's working so we'll go over that um basically we'll let the big brain does what the big brain does and uh then maybe we'll go win some money this weekend sounds good to me <laughs> if you race me in the final they give you a hit <laughs> You go bring Charlie Brown. Oh yeah, Heck yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're. Uh, I love that car. Thank you. We're uh, we're figuring out the. We're lucky. We're in a unique situation. Is we have our hands in a lot of cars, yeah. probably more than what people would know, which is fine. So we we have a lot of. We get a lot of information. You got a lot of data points to look at. Yeah, but we. Uh, We've never really raced a nitrous car. Well, back in the day, remember the purple love truck? Yeah. We raced that thing with Heath, uh, and then Heath got the itch again, and that's how we kind of got Charlie Brown. But the funny thing is, and a lot of people don't realize this, like they just see 10 soldier race cars, and they think like, oh, they're really good at what they do, right? Well, that time when you started doing races at Pacemakers, and we rolled in, that was the second time I ever took that truck down the racetrack and that was my second time I ever went fives in anything. That's insane. So when you saw me at, when you saw us at Clay City, how You guys look like you had your shit together. You're going a, rounds. That's the first time I ever <laughs> went down the racetrack. And anything, like I had a Camaro that went like, it went Tim's once. Yeah. And then they just stuck me in that. We were going like 550s that day. First time I let her go to the button, I went like a 555. I've got some videos I can pull up in the archives. Dude, that's, <laughs> dude, so like, that's what I said, like, you know you see all the wallies and stuff and like that's something that i don't talk about is like when we so we did that race with heath a little bit and then we put our own car together to run radial stuff and we didn't have time to test like you know how it is just, yeah so we're going to lights out for the first time in our own radial car and we already have a lot of customers that have done really well right so like that feeling of pulling into that race and have never taken this car down the racetrack i'm about to go faster than i've ever been front of a crowd that i've like and to have the weight of being like people always think you have your crap together yeah you know what I mean? oh yeah it's a big it's a big name to uphold yeah you know? i wasn't ready to hold it <laughs> <laughs> so i feel it man i feel the same way when i go down the track a lot of time yeah. a lot of pressure well because people almost expect you to win more than you do yeah it's real weird yeah but, sometimes i feel like an idiot and then people look up to me and it's like you know i have a lot to yeah. live up to I feel like sometimes well that's I, I've been trying to be better about like when we went to Bowling Green for the like that we did the same thing you guys whatever what was that local eight um and there was a guy in like a pretty much a stock C8 right, right. and uh he was telling me about that and he's like man I, I don't want to race you guys I'm like I'm like buddy like I was a guy 10 years ago that Flux core MIG welded my turbo kit together to get my Camaro to go, go to LS Fest. And I was a guy that took it down the racetrack for the first time at LS Fest, probably about to oil it down, yeah. right? That was me 10 years ago. You've come a long way. Oh uh, yeah. Little, I feel like I've come a long way too yeah, in like man. a year. It's a journey, like, like. Once that, you're locked in though, you're locked in. You know yeah, I mean? 
Well, that's, things can progress fast. But. Well, to your point, like I've watched, I feel like in a weird way, I've almost watched you grow up. Like I felt like we were almost at the first of, I know you had done more than that, but you know, you run around Clay City with that camera in a dream. Yeah. Like people just are so afraid to take the first step. And then once that ball starts rolling, then you do get the momentum and you get people behind you, but you have to take the first step. Like, yeah. you know, when we opened our shop seven years ago and this, it was a thousand square foot, it was $675 a month. Brad and I had no jobs lined up. I, don't, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit scared. Like, oh, yeah. I got kid. I, I had my first daughter. We had just bought our first house. I'm like, I'm a freaking idiot. Like, I'm leaving of, security for this, yeah. but I wouldn't change You got to make it happen. I wouldn't change a thing, man. Yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. So, we'll get him right today. And then Get the car unloaded, get it in there, and yeah. start looking it over. All right. Yeah, where's the hillbilly, buddy? He's always <laughs> ready for burnout. <laughs> so, if you want to meet everybody, you can just go around and put yeah. a camera in their face. They're going to use that. Moving all these nice rear end housings for that piece of junk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> these are that one's actually going to Cletus. Oh, is it? Yeah, that's for his uh man, he's a great guy. He called, he ordered uh two rear one for Leroy that are four link in it. Yeah. So you got all gotta have all of our four link stuff on it. And then uh they're doing a Mustang with a Godzilla swap or something. Oh. So that's like all the suspension pieces for that. Wow. So, yeah, great dude. I man. might have to have you build me one eventually. We can, we can work out <laughs> something, bud. I mean, we'll work it out. You're looking kind of cute, right? <laughs> <laughs> Disassembly and the welder, and then Brad gets to look at the stuff that's important. So, <laughs> honestly, you don't feel horrible. Not horrible. Right. What, Brad? Yeah. Here's Brad stuff. I mean, it's a fossil. Oh, look at you. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> you know what I mean? It don't take much. Yeah. I mean, it's it's bending like if you if you pull it inch. and then push it, you get a lot of travel. Oh yeah. I'd exit. Like, or straight bar it and then run center. Something. Yeah. Well, it'd be ideal to exit, but I don't know if we have... Uh, we don't have mild. Huh? That's mild steel. That doesn't matter. It's just, I don't know how much room we have. Yeah. So I don't think you're going to get much from that being that loose. It's not that loose. Yeah. When I, it's... Yeah. I agree. That, that doesn't feel that bad, really. No. I've seen them way worse than that. Push it. Watch this. Right. I, I think I would just first. You put that one weight on it like that. It's gonna really deflect a bunch on there. That's beautiful. Thank you. Dalton welded all this. A lot of people think that I'm still welded all the housing. I do every once in a while, but Dalton's 20, and yeah. he's he did all it. It's a little, a little rusty before he goes powder coat, but you can get the idea. Amazing. And then it's got a bigger like this is so that you can you take the fill cap off and you can look down in there with a flashlight and see you know if you have, if you have any issue. wear or anything. Yeah, and then um, so like everyone always wondered like why we call these small tire brackets. So you can see like these brackets over, and I don't want to go through all the geometry, but 
the top here on our stuff small like shorter like yeah. closer to the housing and then the bottom see how long it is right that's just like that's you, way longer than the car the one i got in the car yeah it just helps the geometry when you're on like a 28 or a 29 and like uh, you said you use half inch on all of it that way you have you know room to adjust and you have a lot of holes rather than yeah you know three or four big holes that make big swings yeah this is and they even make like people make the eighth inch adjustable brackets i'm sure you've seen those gangster brackets but man like mo you don't need that like they're nice if you yeah. got money to just burn sure but um and the cool thing this ha this is a chromoly housing um but we also make this in a mild steel so you can buy this housing in mild steel for twenty five hundred dollars and you have every bit of the same adjustment as the chrome alley housing. You're just saving a bit of money. Um, That's a lot cheaper than I thought. Yeah, it's not like we've tried to price them really competitively. Um, Cause we just want like, I don't know, man. Like I want to be able to provide parts for everyone. So like yeah. the guy that's the pro mod car and then the guys like, you know, that's just starting out and yeah. but wants nice parts. Yeah, I mean, it's try to have something for everyone. That's not a bad deal at all, man. No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty fair. So. For the quality of work you're getting and the adjustment, I mean, that's pretty pretty damn good. And the, our mild steel, what's confusing a lot of people is everybody thinks chrome always lighter than mild steel. It's not. Like, when you build a chassis, um, you can use a thinner wall tubing because the chrome always stronger yeah. um, than the mild steel. So the mild steel has to be thicker. That's what makes the chassis heavier. But on our mild steel housings, typically they're for a lower horsepower car. So we actually use a little bit thinner wall. This is a 250 wall tube okay. with a back brace on it. Okay. Um, so that's, dude, that got a lot of horsepower before you run into something with that. There's a lot of bracing in this. Yeah. Um, and the mild steel one's braced exactly the same. It's just, this is a 188 wall tube instead of a 250 wall tube. So it saves a few pounds, which is nice for some people. Um, some people don't care about the weight, but I don't know. I'm always thinking about yeah. that. Uh, but the reason we started doing that is our 8.8 stuff, we've been 440s at 3,000 pounds on an 8.8. Um, you probably have a video of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're driving out of my life at I Beach forgot Bend. about that. I forgot about that. I, so I should have brought that. <laughs> you, you, you didn't have to do it that fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go that fast that time. But, uh, but that car had an 88 in it, and that's a 188 wall tube with no, there's no brake, like there's a front brace on yeah. it, but there's no like big old gangster back brace like this. So, you know, in our opinion, we're like, man, we're building these things for the average person, too heavy duty. We need to find like a, a some middle ground. Yeah. And that's why we do the mild steel housings. So if you were gonna weld this, what what size filler would you have? Um, whatever's laying around. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, probably uh, probably something pretty thin. Yeah. So we keep. Um, I keep like 16th and then 045. I was gonna say 045. Just want to make sure, like a lot of times people grab filler that's too thick, and then it takes more heat to melt the filler than it does to yeah. melt the base metal. So then you just end up with this big old blobby mess. I've got that same cup. I use it for most of my stainless and steel. Yeah, that's perfect. This is, I still use like a regular red, like a small cup a lot on, um, just cause you get in some areas that the big I cup, yeah, the big cup's kind of tough, but obviously this is all wide open. Um, one thing that people do a lot of that they don't think about is like, you get done welding, you got that little contaminated part. So you always want to cut that off. Uh, Every time you stop. Yeah, the other way to do it is, it's like when you're welding to hold it, like, when you get done you need to keep this down here and let the the post flow happen and you can hold keep that down there with it and then that way you don't have to uh you don't have to cut it off 
And then the other important part, like when you're welding something like this, is like, like I'll weld, I'll weld like one of these joints in the middle, and then because these are right next to each other, I'll go somewhere else. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that way you're bouncing around. Yeah, because sometimes like I found if you weld here, sometimes it'll pull it here. Yeah. Pull it here. Yeah, yeah it's a constant like going everywhere and then trying to keep the heat off stuff. Because chromoly like chromoly is inherently brittle. So one of the things you're also trying to do is to keep you want the right amount of heat because the more heat you put in it, the more brittle it gets. So and then I'm kind of like OCD on some of this stuff. So I'll like I'll like wrap this to here. And then I'll let that cool, and then I'll come back and I'll weld one joint yeah. here. Because I don't like multiple starts and stops and stuff. Try to keep the heat out of it. Yeah. And then anywhere, like, like when you notch something, like, that's got, like, a thin spot there. Yeah. So I'll try to put a tack on my thin spot where I know, because, like, if you weld this and you get to here, did you see how like that kind of sort of ran away from me? Yeah. It's because that's the thin spot. So like you always want to have like a little bit of something there. All I'm doing here is like, so I noticed you got stuck out really far. How far can you go before you start running into issues with like not enough gas over there? Depends on the area. So like, like right here, like honestly, you could probably go out another inch and it'd be all right. Cause you have a backstop so that gas is going in there. So all I'm doing is like, I try to get like these corners are obviously hard to get. So when I weld this, I'll weld around to this corner and I have a stop. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That way that you're way like, you can stick it out farther. Yeah, I can do that now. And then when I end, I'm already done. And I don't have to go back in there and revisit it. And then I don't have like, like if you get to here with like normal stick out, then you yeah. gotta stop, do all this again, and then you have like a crappy looking deal. Yeah. So then when we flip this over, I'm gonna start there again on the opposite side, right. and my start stop is hidden. So like when you look at this, which obviously it really doesn't matter, but there's it's all continuous weld. You don't see any of the start stop stuff. <laughs> See how I'm concentrating my heat on the main tube? Yeah. It doesn't have the knock. Then you're just letting it fall. And then when we get here, it start to kind of act up. Yeah, because it's a lot easier to melt this tube and not burn a hole on that side. Correct. You know? That's the whole thing. You're just playing a heat game. Like, we melt this one more into that one. Yeah. Melt this one more into that one. Yeah. Yep. Like we'll do the same thing. Dude. I know you should work in the foot pedal too. Yeah, I'm trying to keep. Heat, yeah, I'm trying to keep heat out of it. So, because all this stuff's thin, you know. What I mean, it's like a 49. So, um, more pedal control. Yeah, a lot of times, like I, I'll run pulse on the machine, but like, um, like it, it's just an on-off pulse. I and mean, I can show you that, but. The, I figured for you, you probably don't have pulse on yours, so this would be better. I, I do, I think, but I never tried it. And I you like working at my own pace. Well, and like most people bring in pulse too early into their welding deal. Like I welded for three years before I ever messed with pulse, mm -hmm. just because like I wanted to know how to control everything myself. Then like like you'll notice D, he's welding on pulse right now. He's welding reason? long. Yeah. And, stretches. and the reason we do that is like I kind of have a, a a spacing that I like our welds to look like. So when we brought on Dalton and I was working with him, I got him set on like those Paul. Now he's able to dial that in himself, but I spaced it in the way that made him weld at the pace that we wanted it. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. It helped manipulate it to where like now like if Dalton welds something or I weld something, you it can't tell the, the difference. So that way, like we can pick up where each other left off, or you know, whatever. And see how, like, I'm always dipping on the very leading edge of the puddle. Yeah. That's a, a lot of times when you're first starting. People try to jam. They feel like they have to jam a bunch of filler in it. 
like like right in the middle of the puddle. Well, like once this starts just barely on the edge of it. Yeah, because like it runs the heat, like it, it wants to melt. Yeah. So as soon as you get close, you just put it on that very leading edge of the puddle, and it helps. Because if you keep like if you're real like inconsistent, that's how you get them like real lumpy looking welds because you're not you're not dipping the same amount every you time. You hold the tungsten a lot closer than what I'm used to, but you could probably do that because you're you're not dipping the filler as close to the tungsten. You're kind of just on the edge. Of Correct, it. on the leading edge. Yeah, you don't that filler doesn't need to go all the way to the tungsten. You know yeah. what I mean? So. But you're concentrating your heat in a very small area. Yep. know why I did that? Why? <laughs> so, we can't blame Jaybird though. <laughs> so, any piece of tube that you fit, yeah. all these tubes of J fit as a, uh, a hole underneath of it, an eighth inch hole. So, this can breathe while it's going. Well, probably on this one, he may have drilled the hole down here, and then this tube was put in, and there's no hole. Okay. So, what happened was this built up with pressure because it's hot and then it got a little thin so it popped air out of it. Hmm. So any, like if you're working, like you don't have to worry about that on turbo kits and stuff, but like if you fit up a piece of tube in a car, you need to drill a hole behind it so that the whole roll cage, the whole roll cage needs to breathe. Yeah, breathe. Yeah. So right, that's- So try to blow back. Yeah, see that's what happened there. We got, we had this really gangster looking deal and then it went. So what we'll do, we'll leave, we'll let that cool, yeah. and then we'll come back to it and fix it. I gotta talk Tommy in and get one of those. Look. You see how that had a tiny bit of a gap? And I nipped like, now you can't see it, but like it. So you're still, you're concentrating all Your the hands way. are so fucking steady. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not even resting on it. They're like, literally so close to like touching and so close to touching the foot, like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's just too so a lot. Time. Yeah, a lot of time. Like I would have cleaned my tungsten probably like six times by now. <laughs> Grind it down. If I could even be like half as good, I'd be okay. <laughs> this had nothing before. Yeah, yeah. You know, if this was all the only thing that tied it together, and then you've got, you know, 14, 12, 14 inches here that's just unsupported. Doing nothing. Doing nothing. One of the reasons I'm a good welder is because I'm not as great of a fabricator. So. See, that's where Rob comes in. He's a good cutter and fitter, and then I, I'm, I yeah. do the welding. Like, it's hard to be really, really good at both. It is. Yeah, it, it takes is. a lot of time. And Jay and Brad It's easy both. just to you know, be able to sit down and have somebody here weld it. Yeah, you know? and that's what you know, Brad and Jay do. They build it, and then I weld it, so it works out great. I mean, he added this in there, what, took him 30 minutes. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, I, yeah, it would have took me forever. Oh yeah. So, all the notches and everything getting everything perfect. Yeah, and he was like that little bit of a gap. Jay was like bummed on it. He was to make that piece, but I'm like man, we, I, it's fine. <laughs> Like it never happened. Yes, I can see it, but <laughs> it's, it's I not, mean, pretty good for the circumstances. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't bad. Kind of smoothed it out. Yeah, get in there and do a little TIG body work. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize how much time goes into building a race car. No idea. <laughs> a nice race car. Yeah. You know I mean, you can build a. You can build it five times faster, but it's gonna be, you know, pretty junky. Yeah. It's, that's. And honestly, man, that's one of the reasons that we're trying to build less of them is, uh, is you know, it sounds generic, but we care too much, you know? Like, I, I really like them to, like, um, I want someone to get in it and look at every little piece and be like, holy crap, like, 
like this was built for me yeah and it you know i can see the time that it took on each like little thing but like a lot of times not that people don't appreciate it they just don't understand what it took to make it that nice yeah. you know um but that's how i feel about every edit yeah it's the same <laughs> yeah <laughs> I noticed uh, you run like a shorter tungsten and you like to use like a short cap and you put your finger over the edge and yeah. you get a little more control. Yeah, especially on like stuff like this, like like when you're welding like a rear end housing or like the parts that Dalton's doing, you need to be back like this just to get keep yourself away from the heat. But you'll have something else to rest your hand on. Yeah. So when you're kind of doing like this tight, like small, tedious stuff, it don't get hot enough, you know, you can kind of do that in right. I'm like waiting to see a, a mess up and I'm like, can't find one. <laughs> the entire weight of the collar like side to side and there's no bracing. If you can if you can bend that with your body weight against the floor. Yes, it's probably no good. <laughs> yeah, like there's no way it doesn't bend when it goes like this side to side the full weight of the car doing that. No, it is. Like, way more than somebody's body weight pushing down on the floor. Well and like um so a four-link car does help with some of that because it's a parallel four-link. So, um, like, the, it doesn't need as much anti-roll bar and stuff as a like a stock suspension car. Obviously, you know, like the Falcon, the the uppers are triangulated, so that helps yeah. keep the rear end tracking space, but it doesn't keep it from doing that deal. Yeah. So where the four-link does, it's almost this guy's is kind of too complicated, but the like a four-link car doesn't need as much anti-roll bar as what a really fast stock suspension car is. So you drive a stock suspension car on the street, it's made to do that. You, that rear end, because the bars are straight, it has a hard time doing that. But it still has, obviously, that side to side. Yeah, so it's like a give and take. Like really, like the you know, the triangulated four-link as far as keeping the end track in my opinion is a better deal, right? I agree. But yeah, they like even like our new Fox body, like. You know, we're going that stock suspension because I like that I don't have to have wishbone. Yeah. Less weight from the back of the weight. <laughs> you worried about that little piece? <laughs> it all adds up, bud. Dang. I guess that's good for sacrificing years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like anything else, like somebody that takes a lot of time to learn guitar or learn how to skateboard or... It's funny, man. I have like... Like, I have no rhythm. Like, I can't dance. I tried to learn to play the drums once, it was horrible. And uh, I was telling my wife, we're, my wife is, she got a little block in it, so she's, she's incredible. Like, she's a great dancer. I can't dance at all. But I'm like, I don't have any rhythm. She's like, yes, you do. Like, I'm like, I don't. You do well. Like, you have perfect rhythm with that. I'm like, that's the only next thing. time you go to the dance park, just take a pink torch. It'll all come natural. Yeah. <laughs> we're killing it. Do you always use your left foot for the pedal, or do you go both? I go both, yeah. Because. <laughs> <laughs> and with the Actually, like, on the pedal. Yeah, yeah, wherever I'm at. dropped a, a plumb bob off the center of the uh, core support, found the center of the front of the car, dropped plumb bob up there. And then you drop a plumb bob off of um, the rear end on both sides. So I just dropped it off of the brake rotor. 
it's centered on the studs. And then you basically measure from your center point in the front back to this plumb bob and that back to that plumb bob. Uh -huh. And that's how you figure out if the rear end's square in the car. That makes sense. So I can tell you either the brackets on the rear end or the brackets on the chassis are a little bit off, which is normal. Yeah. Normally they are. Um, the brackets on the rear end are a little bit uh, different <laughs> from the brackets on the chassis too. They're yeah. different width. So because I, I measured from the chassis bracket to the rear end and I made them the same length on both sides, I basically made the bars the same length. And then when I triangulated it back, this side was a quarter inch farther forward than that side. So that tells you that one of the bra brackets is off in the car a little bit. Well, that makes sense because I set everything up pretty much like neutral and I tried to get it like yeah. as square as I could without using plumb bobs or whatever, but who knows, you know? Yeah. And it was driving left just a little bit, so. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that way, you know, that the rear end's you know, perfectly square in the car. So I always start square and neutral and then, you know, make adjustments depending on what the car's doing. My man Brad just got finished scaling the car for us, plotting out the four link and setting it up, make sure it's square, as square as it can be. Yeah, it turned out good. Yeah, we got her squared up after changing all the rod ends, beefing up the wishbone, and then uh, put it down on the scales and set the preload in the four link and the anti roll bar. So, should be ready to go to the racetrack. Thank you so much. Man. Yeah, no problem, buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah.